Go for it. Freaking what up, dude? Um, Strider Wilson, I'm the host of this podcast that's mine. It's gonna be called History is Nice. History is What you do today echoes in eternity. It's Maximus Decimus Meridius from a dank little movie called Gladiator. Maybe you've seen it. If you haven't, I think I've watched it enough times for all. It might be the movie I've seen the most. Aaron, what's the movie you think you've seen the most? Um, Back to the Future. Yep. Oh, funny enough, you know, it was my sister's B-Day the other day, and we did like a, she turned the big 4-0. And she did like a little 80s theme bird birthday because she was born in 1980. And mm-hmm. uh, that math checks out. I put on I put on Back to the Future on the TV. You know, when we were grilling, we were kind of having a little chill time. We played a few 80s jams. Just a little family thing in the backyard, you know. You know, nice and distanced outside. Grilled up some salmon. Dank, dude. Freaking superfood. Bed that shit in quinoa and just do, you know, when we serve up salmon, dude, you know, in the part of that like food pyramid, dude, it's freaking 10 push ups and 10 sit ups with that, you know? Bed of quinoa, cedar plank salmon, no sauce, asparagus, let's go. Push ups, sit ups, boom, trade them all off. Are you one of those people, Aaron, that my GF does this? She's perfect. She's, she's unflawed, you know, but everyone does have a flaw, and I love her for those flaws because her one flaw is that she is the type of person who, like, when you have a Thanksgiving dinner plate, she will finish all of the corn, then finish all of like the turnips or whatever, then finish all of the peas. I'm surprised she has not finished me because that's how a cel- serial killer eats. I'm surprised I'm not dead right now. Is that, is, do you eat Thanksgiving like that, Aaron, or do you mix things up and go about it, you know? Uh, I'm, I might be on her side on this one. Whoa. <laughs> no. Look, good people do this. You're a good dude. <laughs> Obviously love my GF. What's going on? What's what's the th- thinking behind that? It's just kind of, are you just naturally do that? Like you don't notice it, or do you notice? Yeah, it? I'm kind of a task oriented, so I'm just like, I got to finish this one thing, and then I'm moving on to something else. And whoa, see, but it's your Thanksgiving meal. You got to check out. It's not a task. Yeah, it's an enjoyment. Thanksgiving might be different, and I've only really recently, in the last few years, gotten super into Thanksgiving dinner. I was, I don't <sighs> like turkey. I still don't. Whoa. Um, but I've gotten into a, a lot of the other stuff. Um, which I wasn't so into before. Um, I love that. Making, you know, new processes. You yeah, know. yeah. That's trying to trying to grow. That's fine. And that's expand. What I'm about. But yeah, it's um that might be different. I don't I'm never gonna be a person who's gonna put everything in a bowl and mix it. Like that's just not That's a lot. I'm. My brother does that. That's yeah. like a lot. Like, yeah, I'm not about to mix everything and like, oh, stir it all up and get wild with it. My grandpa, I, who maybe I got this from, uh, he would literally Everything would be on the plate in its in its spot, and he would rotate the plate so that whatever he was eating was in front of him. Sounds like a marine, rather than reaching over. Was we'll he a marine? He, he was a Polish army soldier. Yeah. There you go. That's a that's a soldier's diet, right? Yeah, maybe that's like the most optimal way to eat. There's people that are all into like optimal eating now. Of like, watch this freaking doc dude on Netflix, dude. Freaking gaining knowledge, and it's just about some dude who's like. I figured out the most optimal way to eat an egg and it's, I crack and it's pretty good. It's gross. So he like chugs the, he takes the yolks, puts them in a different bowl, chugs it like Gaston from Beauty and the Beast. Then he cooks up the egg white and eats those after. And he's like, this is the most optimal way for my body to digest this protein. So I'm like, geez, dude, imagine this guy in the bedroom. <laughs> this is the most optimal way for me to jizz quickly. So if I am doing a, if I'm a power bottom, I would prefer to do regular cowgirl. <laughs> and uh, heavy eye contact, mild amount of petting, a sensation, maybe a little pull of my hair. If you could do a little pull of my hair, that will get me to where I need to be quite quickly. And um, honestly, the dad is not out on you yet, honey, but um, we'll get there. We'll get there. It's like, hey, how about you rush that data, dude? <laughs> anyway, got sidetracked. Just wanted to say, um, you know, for personal history right now, um, took a big W. And the reason I said what you say echoes in eternity is... Um, You know, as you might know, JT, my dog, uh, has been giving me a lot of flack and everyone in my fantasy league about Leonard Fournette. They've been calling him Fat Net, which I don't support that body shaming. And honestly, he's not even fat. 
It's like a 228 pound, six foot running back with, you know, downhill runner and breakaway speed. Honestly, former first round pick. I don't know how you don't draft him. Now he did get waived by his team, the Jags, and that hurt, you know, and I took a lot of flack mainly for that. And they try to say I overpaid for him, even though I think I captured good value at 35. And I think that's starting to show, seeing how he put up two tuds and 100 yards rushing this week. Thank you. Buccaneers Fantasy Player of the Week. Thank you. Now, when this episode comes out, fantasy season will be over and I might have no championship. But right now, and I'm saying let this echo in eternity, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling happy. We'll see what will come. But it's something that I can stand by and knowing that when this episode comes out in a few weeks, that I'll feel good. Who's, and who's the coach on the Buccaneers? Sorry Bruce, to interrupt. Bruce Arians is the coach now. Ah, he was the former Cardinals coach, and yeah, yeah, yeah. He, quarterback guy. Exactly, works well with QBs, and now he's got you know the goat TB12 over there. I like Tom Brady, but you know I get annoyed by Patriots fans, of course, because they're all about winning. You know, Boston man, he's the best team in the world. You know, Tom Brady, like everyone thinks that they're, they're like on the team or something like that. I'm like, no, dude, get out of here. And just there was a, a, like a few years ago where like Boston won the ch- NBA championships, the Bruins won the hockey, and then the Patriots, of course, won. I'm just like I'm sick of it. Yeah, it's too much. Win- and then yeah, and then they the, call themselves uh, Title Town now. Oh, that's disgusting. Get out of here. And yeah, dude. The, and then the Red Sox beat the and they're cheating and they beat the Dodgers with that man. Who's the manager who was cheating? Alex Cora. Yeah, Alex Cora. Get out of here, Alex Cora, dude. Title Town. Get out of here, dude. Pfft. Whack, dude. Should just be called the town because it's a dank movie with Affleck, dude. Yeah, I like that he puts a scene of himself just doing push-ups in that movie for pretty much no reason. Yeah, Yeah. I like that though. You know, he works out. You got to work out, dude. He uses his mental muscles and his regular muscles to pull off heists, and that's legit. You know, he's carrying around ARs with extended clips in that movie. You know, dressed as a nun and wearing a mask. Got to be able to breathe. You got to be in shape to pull off those heists. You know, sick. Um, But anyway, dude, just saying. It's fire. I did take an L, though. I will tell you I took an L in my fantasy team, and I did. It becomes so painful to watch, and what I'm realizing about fantasy is that I basically am just signing up for stress every week. Unless yep. I'm winning, then I feel great. That's why That's why I don't do it. <laughs> You're smart not to. I had to leave. Usually I'm glued to the TV on Sundays, and I said to my GF, and she was actually quite pleased when I was losing. I was like, let's go, let's go take a walk. Let's go check out. And we just strolled, and we saw a little store you know local store freaking just selling some succulents you know cool little potted hanging succulents picked a few of those up hang those up feeling fire about that nice decor decor gonna go on my balcony now maybe hang one in the bathroom you know so you know there's there's silver lining there you know i got a w uh in the fact that i found some good tasteful fun well-priced succulents to hang around me in my gf's GF's dank apartment uh even though i took an l and i thought about it and i tossed and turned all night having fever dreams from playing too much Call of Duty. So, you know, this is the life I lead. But I'm fired up, you know? Maybe I'll even put a succulent on my dank credenza when I find a new one. Because right now I don't have a new one. I had to sell the old ones on Craigslist. And in fact, I've been missing it so much that today's historical share is about the history of credenzas, dude. It's going to be sick. Oh, boy. The history of... I didn't even know what a credenza was. Until I started dating my dank GF, my rock, my coral, she opened up my eyes to these things. It's what, you know, it's dank. you got to open yourself up to new things. Like Aaron's opening himself up to trying turkey now, Thanksgiving meal. You know, you, Aaron, do you, did you know, when did you find out what a credenza was in your life? I might still not be 100% on that. All right, so that's the exact reason I'm doing this app. Because there's dudes out there listening who are going, I think I know what a credenza is. And a credenza, in everyone's defense... It's a somewhat confusing piece of furniture to identify because there's things that are just like it. And in fact, oftentimes gets a misnomer of a side table or a buffet. And we're going to get into that right now. So, um, you know, it's an interesting subject to tackle. How do you tackle the history of a credenza or find out what it is, you know? Um, And I think we got to ask ourselves, well, there's a common, um, I guess, uh, not like saying but like just teaching or philosophy behind what is a chair you ask yourself what is a chair right you look at it and i say a chair something i sit on dude i just sit down i it's got four legs maybe a backrest maybe not i sit on it well we're already creating distinctions right there of one having a backrest and one not also what's my relationship 
to said chair. Chairs in history, there's a throne. Look at the dank show Game of Thrones. It's made of, it's forged from that dragon's breath, all that steel. You know, what's the meaning behind having that throne, the power to it? It's not just something you sit on. It's the position of who gets to sit on that chair. Think about, you know, you got your spot on the couch. That you, that's your go-to spot. You know, Thanksgiving family gets together. You're hosting, dude, and your uncle's just going to go plop down on your spot and not move all that, that all day. He's a buster, dude. That's gonna it's gonna impact your Thanksgiving because of your relationship to that spot on your couch, aka that chair. You know? Your toilet. That's your throne, dude. It's where you go in there. It's, it's a huge piece, huge component of your drill factory, you know? Are you setting up your laptop in there? Placing it down, pulling up, in my case, maybe Wayfair. Maybe CB2, looking at a tastefully de decorated home, living room, and imagining me and my Jeff in there, imagining. Don't sell yourself short when you're enjoying and drilling yourself on your imagination. Use your imagination that way. You can get creative, you know? White picket fence, come home. This is a life that we built together. This is dank, smooches. One thing leads to another, and enjoyed. 30 seconds later. Something to think about. In any case, the chair analogy. I'm sitting in a high chair right now. There's a director's chair. The piece of furniture isn't just, I say chair, our mind goes somewhere. What does that say about you where your mind goes? Aaron, when I say chair, what do you envision? What do you picture in your mind's eye? I mean, yeah, four, four legs mm -hmm. uh, and a back, and you can sit on it. Back, is it made of wood? Yes. Yeah, it's wood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mid-century modern, does it twist? Does it swivel? No. No twist, no swivel, just a stern chair. Uh -huh. Okay. Maybe this gets even to a philosophical element of, see, my chair swivels. Maybe it's like, oh, I like to go different directions in my life. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a, if I get in that here, an idea, boom, I'm running that way, then I do something, I'm a little bit of a squirrel chasing an acorn sometimes. You sounds like, you know, and I, I would do believe this about you, you're set. You got your principles. You got your foundation. It sounds like your chair is built in right there. It's where it needs to go. It's where it needs to be, facing the in one steady direction, even though in my opinion it's the wrong direction, which might be five guys, you know? In any case. And I will eat the burger and then the fries. That's, oh, I knew you would. Yeah. I, do, I did think that you would have gone fries first, though. It might be, yeah, it might be, yeah. Probably actually is. It probably makes more sense, because that's what my GF does when we're crushing in and out. She gets well-done fries and then eats all of them. And I'm like, what are you doing? Well, yeah, those you they don't keep as long, so you got to get them. You got to get them quick. It is true. The In and Out fry is an inferior fry. Oh yeah, to most other fries. However, the burger can't be touched. You can't even touch it. Don't even think about it. Don't even think about it. It's the best burger in the world. You're kidding me. So, I bring up this chair analogy, just because I want to sort of train our minds to be thinking that way right now, not just thinking plain old chair. But thinking, what's the meaning behind that chair? Why is that chair there? What's that chair's relationship to things around it? And then I will pose the question now, or posit the question, if you will, because I wrote that word down and I just really want to say it. Posit, because it makes me sound tight. It makes me sound dank. Someone says, pulls a clip from this podcast and they go, whoa, did Strutter just said posit? It's a fucking smart podcast, dude. If your coworker happens to walk in and you know you take your headphones down and you're you're blasting it, honestly, dude, if you're listening to this podcast, I don't know if there's a way to do this, Aaron. You're the tech, you might know. Put a little bass to this pod, you know, just a little bit. Boom, 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 boom. Just hear me talking about, dude. What is a credenza? What makes it so dank? Doom, doom, doom. Could be sick. Could be sick. Throw a little bass into anything in life. It's gonna make it a little more sick. That's all I'm saying. Would you do that, Aaron? Maybe even a bass guitar, like damp, damp. damp. Little flea riff, dude. Damp, 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 damp. Listen to this pod. Sick. That's all I'm saying. Not enough bass in podcasting. Um, you know, much like my food at the table, I uh, I want one thing at a time, so I, I need that voice by itself. True. Might not be. Uh, <laughs> some things shouldn't, shouldn't really be mixed. Like two great things often shouldn't be mixed. Like boning is tight, and so is skateboarding. Boning while skateboarding, difficult task. But if it can't be pulled off, that's also sick. So who's to say? Go out and live life. Try it. Um, 
So I will pause at the freaking question. What is a credenza and what makes it so dank? Um, well, using this mindset that I've tried to instill in the listener right now, of value, stopping and looking around at things, uh, much like sort of, you know, to pat my own back here, how I draft in fantasy, I see value. I'm not just going to drop heavy bucks because I draft auction style. Uh, I don't do snake draft. It's not nearly as fun. Um, I draft auction style. I'm not going to dra- drop, you know, a third or even more of my budget on Saquon or McCaffrey. What if they go down? And case in point, look at this season. There's so many injuries. This season, they've had no preseason. So it's going to be even more risk to do that. So I'll, I'm going to do value. I'm going to be fluid. You know what I mean? So I want you to think that way when listening to this. And But let's start out with something a little more rigid, you know. If you look up credenza on dictionary.com, which I freaking did, dude, because I'm a detailed researcher, um, it says this, credenza, freaking noun, dude, a closed cabinet for papers, office supplies, etc., often of desk height and matching the other furniture in an executive's office. So they're already creating boundaries around the credenza, even though I am fired up by these boundaries, saying it's an executive piece of furniture that fires me up. I can see me in a Mako suit, and if you don't say know what I'm talking about when I say Mako suit, it means it's the shade of a Mako shark. It's not made of Mako skin, but when, I, when purchasing suits, I always think you should go with some sort of shark skin suit. It's a power move, okay? Let you know I'm a shark. Going out there, I smell blood in the water. I smell weakness during my deal. I'm a pounce, and I'm gonna freaking make moves. I'm gonna cash checks, and I'm gonna freaking break necks. Sick. I want to think of something sicker to say than break necks, but honestly, don't be good trying to be great. Um, so that fires me up that it's an executive piece of furniture, dude. It's like, oh, I got it means you have an office that can fit a dank credenza in there, but this doesn't tell me that much about it. Desk height, matching other furniture. Does it need to match? I mean, okay, why, why are there so many things, dude? And, you know, a credenza is much more than that, you know? At least in meaning what I what it means to me. Went to another freaking website, dude. Furnitureholesalers.com. Figured, let's go to the source, you know? Let's go to wholesalers, dude. Let's see what they got to say about the product, you know? Maybe there's some carpenters there. You know, they're, they're the ones, you know, obviously they're probably teaming up with some people in PR and marketing, dude. But, you know, they're informing them about the product. Let's see what they got to say. A credenza in its simplest terms is a cupboard or sideboard. Traditionally, a credenza, traditionally credenzas are used for staging and tasting meals before serving, but are now used in many different areas of the home or office. These days, a credenza is the cabinet-style piece of furniture that flanks a desk or conference table as a second workspace and storage area. Okay. Now we're getting somewhere. Traditionally used to serve foods. Didn't know that. Didn't know that, dude. I was using a... Sort of a buffet style. That's sick. Um, it's tight. We're getting more uses out of it, you know? So what I'm, what I'm learning about a credenza now, it's more versatile than just being in an office. Uh, it can, it's used for staging things, dude. That's sick. Home or office, as opposed to the dictionary, which just says is typically in an office. Cabinet style. Although, you know, I've seen credenzas with hatches or hutches, if you will. Seen some with drawers, dude. What does that distinction create, dude? Let's go ahead and take a step further here. Finding out what a credenza is, you got to find out what a credenza is not. It's an important step to make and an important distinction to make. Said, in the simplest terms, a credenza is a cupboard or sideboard. Well, then why do we have the word credenza, dude? What is a sideboard? I freaking looked it up, bro. Don't worry, I got everyone's back. Freaking sideboard is similar to a credenza, dude. It's got a long shape, low profile, and ample storage space. I'm getting fired up just thinking about this, thinking about stepping into the drill factory when I read a sentence like that, those nice threes. Unlike a credenza, sideboards typically have cabinets that extend to the floor and can come out with hutches that add additional space for display, fine china, or other decorative pieces. They are commonly placed in living rooms, dining rooms, or hallways. This seems more like an armoire to me. See, it sounds like an armoire is just a sideboard with that extra sort of closet space. You know, it's something like not quite a wardrobe, you know, not quite something you could step into and f- go into a magical world in your imagination, dude, you know, which I do recommend you do in your drill factories. But sounds like a sideboard, 
you know, it's doesn't have, it doesn't really have the legs. Whereas a credenza might have legs, though they're very low built. Um, let's find out what a buffet is. This might be a little more telling for us. First of all, just fired up. There's a piece of furniture called a buffet. I did not know that. I always thought it was just table set up. Um, and honestly, buffets. We've been talking about dining here, and I think buffet might be my favorite form of dining. What about you? Which is, do you get fired up on buffets? Um, I always kind of get grossed out by buffets. I mean, there's definitely a sick element. People are touching things or throwing stuff back in there. You can get diver- diverticulitis. You know, it's a cruise ship scenario. I, I see that. Yeah. Get neurovirus, something sick, you know, coronavirus probably. Mm-hmm. I feel that. But I mean, dude, a Vegas buffet, you're, you're a little aged over from the night before. You wake up, you know, it's just got everything, bro. I mean, I like sun. the have everything element, certainly. Yeah. And the and the go get it yourself and the. the it's also a great no if you're, judgment about it. <laughs> if you're entertaining guests at your home, and you have a credenza, and it's Thanksgiving, like I like Thanksgiving, where dude, I hate it Thanksgiving when you got guests, and you got to you got to ask for someone to pass the gravy. What I love about buffet is the gravy's just there. And you go past the gravy. And if you want it, you just get up and go get it rather than be like, hey, um, Uncle Jeff, uh, I don't know what type of mood you're in right now. You're usually pretty grumpy and probably a little bit buzzed right now. But um, can you pass the gravy? And he's just, <laughs> Ugh. <sighs> the guy likes the gravy. Like some weird joke. That's not a joke, which just means that the punchline is like that he wants the gravy by him. And I'm like, whoa, being taxed emotionally when I need just gravy on Thanksgiving. Maybe I'm just, you know, this is quite therapeutic for me right now. That's why I'm saying buffet. It's a great way to serve. It's a great way to do it. You're having a birthday party in the park? Go buffet style. Grill up the dogs. Put them all out on a slaver or whatever. People come up. They make their own dogs. The condiments are right there. Let's go. Don't all need to pass them to each other. It's a dank, dank way of dining. And I'm fired up. There's a piece of furniture probably... Not named after it, but probably uh, is the etymology of the dining experience and a dining uh, method. The pain, dis- the the main distinguishing quality of a buffet is that they typically have longer legs and are taller than credenzas or sideboards. Buffets provide a moderate amount of storage and are great for laying out food for buffet style dining. So not necessarily functional for storage here, but a little higher up, easy to access. Whereas earlier I said the the credenza has a little bit. Smaller, smaller legs. So if you see, if you're in someone's home or apartment or whatever, and they're like, oh, dude, just place that down on the credenza and it's got some tall legs, you might be like, oh, you mean the buffet? Pfft, power move. And you just hold eye contact. Oh, hey, man, can you um, grab a record out of the credenza? Oh, you mean the hutch, which clearly distinguishes it as a sideboard? Yeah, dude. What record do you want me to get out? The monkeys? Because you like them more than the Beatles? And then just hold eye contact. Yeah. That's what's up. Oh, hey, man. Can you um go ahead and get that uh, cookbook that I placed on top of the credenza over there? Oh, you mean in the middle portion of your armoire? Because it clearly has an arcing ball to chino above it with space for wardrobe even though it's not functionally used for that purpose, though it does serve an aesthetically pleasing element. Yeah, I'll grab that cookbook, bro. And I'm going to have you for dessert, dude. Because I'm feasting on you right now, bro. So what this podcast is going to set you up to do. Straight up domination. But you shouldn't do it all the time, but just know that you have the power to, and that's kind of nice to have in your back pocket, you know? But if someone oversteps you, you know, calls you out for a stain on your T-shirt or, you know, a piece of food in your teeth when you're making a political point at dinner. You just go ahead and bank that memory and then put it in your arsenal and pull it out later if you have to. Sick. I'm sick. I'm sick. Um, So now, let's talk about credenza. I've talked about buffet and just dank etymology of the word. What's the etymology of credenza here, dude? Um, well, originated from the Italian word for belief, dude. Credenze. Frickin' credenzas were first used to store food that would be tested for poison before serving to aristocrats, dude. From the 14th century to now. 
The defining characteristic and purpose of a credenza has changed in several ways, of course, though it continues to be a staple in many households. That's tight. It's a piece of furniture that goes back to having freaking someone's back. And that fires me up. Even though it's the king's back, and the dude doing it was probably had no choice but to do it, and honestly probably died sometimes, so that's not tight. But it's freaking sick to just know that, dude. It's about belief, dude. So when you freaking see the dude that tests the king's food, and... You know, he puts some sauce on there. Maybe he's having a poke bowl. I don't know if they had poke bowls back then, but it's, it's Italy, dude. They could have been crushing some dank fish from the Mediterranean. And he's like, dude, um, this is dank. This ponzu sauce is legit. Go ahead and enjoy your highness. And then he's like, all right, thank you, dude. That's sick. So at this point, we've just been pretty much talking about credenzas. We've been talking about what credenzas aren't. We've made some distinctions. And we've been talking about them sort of how they stand alone. And talking about fish has fired me up, and it's made me think of this um, sort of this, not fable, dude. I keep wanting to know this of like, what's the word for like allegory, not an allegory, but like lessons, you know? Like just life lessons that are no, known, sort of ubiquitous, ubiqu freaking <laughs> ubiquitous. Um, like, uh, you know, not idioms, like you don't put all your eggs in one basket, mm. but... I don't know, dude. Not a proverb. It's not quite a proverb, but something like that. But this is going to be from it's this dude, Professor Luis, and I'm going to bo butcher his name, dude. Professor Agassiz, A-G-A-S-S-I-Z. -S -S He's a freaking straight up Harvard professor, dude. And a student wrote an essay on his, and it's just about observation where he observes, and it made me think of it with his fish, this like hemulean type fish. I don't know what type of fish it is. But anyway, dude, picture a fish in your dome, dude. And the student's in Harvard, and he's fired up to study with this well-known uh, scientific professor. And he gets there, and he's probably thinking he's going to do some technical stuff and get gnarly on his first day. We're going to dive right in. I'm prepared. And Professor Agassiz, or however you say his name is, he's just like, all right, bro, there's a fish. Look at it. I'm going to go to lunch. I'll be back. And he just cruises out. And the student looks at it, and he's all diligent, Harvard style. Well, okay, the fish just scales, dude. Okay, we'll look at this. All right, I'm, and he's like about 10 minutes later, he's all, all right, dude, I think I freaking found out pretty much all I can about this fish. The professor comes back. He's like, still not back. You know, it's a long lunch, dude. What's he doing? He's probably housing multiple poke bowls or something. And it's like, man, all right, well, I guess I've got extra time. Maybe, you know what, dude, I'm going to draw this fish. Take a pencil, I'm going to draw this thing. Maybe I'll do that. Could be sick. Give me some extra points, dude. I want to get a good grade here. Finally, hours later, professor comes back. He's like, oh, sweet, dude. He used a pencil, dude. He's like, a pencil is a good eye. Sick. I'm fired up that you used that. Um, cool. All right. Let's come back tomorrow. He's like, okay, cool. I guess I did okay. Comes back the next day. Professor's like, all right, get back at it. Study the fish. I'm going to go do some research and post up and whatever, dude. And probably text if I had texting back then, but this wasn't then. It's like the 1800s or something, dude. And probably went and wrote a letter to someone dude and uh per students kind of just like what i looked at the fish yesterday i'm just looking at a fish again and then hours later professor comes back he's like all right what can you tell me about the fish he's like well it's got these scales like i counted a lot of them good good what else can you tell me um well it has like this ridged thing here he goes okay excellent nice of you to notice that but you're, are, you're missing a clear, clear thing about this fish, and um, maybe go home and sleep on it. I won't grade you today. So he kind of power moves him, making the student second guess himself. He's like, what? You know, I'm just looking at a fish. How can I look at a fish wrong? Goes home and sleeps. He's stressing out. Comes back the next day in the morning. Professor's like, well, what do you got to tell me about the fish? It's like, dude, freaking, it's got freaking asexual. It's got freaking symmetrical organs on both sides, dude. And if you look at it, it's perfectly um, the same, dude. And the professor was like nice i'm glad that you caught that that's tight good keep looking at the fish I said, what so i passed your test i drew it you still want me to look at the fish okay so the student freaking buys in and just looks at it hard dude starts thinking about it notices the smells of it looks at its eyes notices weird discolorations distinctions in the eyes notices where you know starts measuring out using other tools to measure out where the dorsal fins are and then the back fins traces the thing sees how big it is dude looks at all these things and the professor's like okay matching these things sick dude 
sends him home. Comes back the next day. Professor then pulls out another fish, same species, same thing, and immediately the distinctions pop out to the student and the lesson is learned, whoa, what use are facts? And then oh, let me pull the quote because I want to get it exactly what, it, what this freaking dude says. Freaking Agassiz, dude. He says, what use are facts if they are not related to the surroundings around us, dude? Boom. So much of us, dude, are quick to jump to facts or just when we're arguing, use a fact. But what does that mean in relation to what? This dude's just straight up staring at a fish. He's learning all these facts about it. And yeah, he's going, this doesn't mean anything to me. Well, what, the, what the heck? Then you pull out another fish, even something close to it. You can immediately make dis distinctions between it, dude. And this is something important when looking at a credenza. Because so many of us, and I was guilty of this myself, look at a credenza and I go, okay, great. That's just a credenza. Oh, no. It's a side table. It's a freaking armoire. It's a freaking buffet. Oh, that credenza is made of wood. This other one's made of stainless steel. Oh, this one has marble or granite topping. Oh, this one has slightly higher legs. Oh, this one has shelving for a record player. Oh, this one. Immediately these distinctions pop out. Now they're more obvious than on the fish, but it's the same principle. Okay. Appreciating what's happening here, dude. Right. And I looked up some different credenzas, dude. Okay. Looked up a credenza from the Bastogne case piece collection, dude. Consists of a cabinet, sideboard. It's designed by the master cabinet maker and designer, Antrie Hatrikinian. Guaranteed I butchered that name. For a Poyot studio. There's studios for credenzas, dude. Art, bro. Okay? And this totes the line of somewhere between art and design. Okay, it's an important distinction. But this collection showcases the designer's interest in studying light and shadow, as well as the appreciation of functional craftsmanship in his work. You look at this credenza, and it's tough because you're listening to a podcast, but it basically looks like drumsticks vertically in sort of an elliptical shape. It even has a false cabinet on it that you can clearly see, see behind, but then you can place things in that void behind it like a succulent, something dank, like I purchased this past Sunday with my GF, or a book, something tight, okay? On top of it, maybe a photo of you guys, the Grand Canyon, or maybe just the Grand Canyon if you want to go more tasteful, black and white, Ansel Adams style. And then the light hitting the credenza dancing. I used to talk about how the light would dance off of that crimson marfil on my old credenza, which I do miss deeply. It's like a sculpture. It's almost like a Rodin at this point. It's playing with the void while also taking up space itself. It's something that can stand alone. It's something that says, oh, if, if the owner of this credenza clearly appreciates form. And perhaps the function of this credenza rather than storage is more form. And that's fine. In contrast, take the Bon Chef 50158. Okay, just listen to the names. Bastone Case Piece Collection. Poyat Studio. That sounds French or something, dude as opposed to the Bone Chef, which sounds also French. But then it's got numbers, 50158. Price point on this puppy, 20K. The artistic one, the Bastogne piece collection, 10K. These credenzas get up there, dude, all right? Now you can get some dank ones for around 500 or even less, but you know, quality of the uh, materials is going to go down. Now, the Bone Chef, stainless steel. It's a contemporary buffet, okay? Now we're knowing its function here. It's five induction ranges to help your serving line. This is an industrial style, style, size credenza here, something that will be in a hotel. The unit's stainless steel exterior is easy to clean and maintain, okay? Look at the function we're getting here. Provides a stylish presentation, okay? We're not lacking in form, along with rounded corners, contrasting dark countertop. Freaking, I love induction, keeping food warm, dude. Okay, it's got, it's got a freaking... 110 volt electrical connection to operate heat platforms on this puppy, dude. This Bond Chef, dude. It's restaurant style, hotel style credenza. Didn't even know that you could have credenzas in the kitchen. If you would have just gone to dictionary.com and read about a credenza 
you would have said, oh, dude, I guess they just go in my dad's office. He's an executive. You know, maybe Don Draper put some scotch on it, dude, and freaking Waterford crust, Crystal, and then just freaking, you know, talks about making ad campaigns, dude, and freaking how to cheat on his wife. But credentials are more than that. Now, these are extreme points, extreme comparisons I made here, but it's just to prove a point, you know, that where this credenza is in a kitchen, in a freaking very tasteful modern home, like the bone, the freaking, what's it called again? The freaking Bastone piece collection, which sounds like something that two, you know, adult 35 year olds would have stand up sex next to, you know? They would meet at like a, you know, a boa or a Mastro's. And, you know, both of them probably drive Jaguars. And both of them are probably art curators. Maybe one works for a magazine. I don't know. They both have nice tans and drink Michelob Ultras. And they go back and have stand-up sex next to a credenza because it makes perfect sense. Why would you do it in the bed when you can have the light dancing off their elegant bodies? You know? Feel like... Tom Ford or David Fincher would direct that scene in my mind. Whereas the Bone Chef could be something from that horrendous movie that Bradley Cooper did called like Burn or something like that. Burnt, yeah. Burnt. Yeah, man, that one was a dud. Some good scenes. I feel like the Bone Chef was Anthony Bourdain's nickname at one point. Oh, fire call. Rest in peace. What a legend, dude. Love Bourdain. The Bone Chef. Good call. Should be a show on like the E network or the oxygen network where just an attractive chef goes around and tries food and then, you know, bones. I guess that's kind of what all the, um, maybe not survivor, but like real world and all those things are to a degree. I'd like to do just like a real estate style show where I just go around and Instead of selling homes, I just sell credenzas, dude, and just, you know, just call it selling dankness, dude, and just go around, put credenzas in people's homes, have a company where you can just try it out, you know, if you want to feel it out for a little bit, 30 days, dude, go back, talk to the couple, see what they think. It'd be a sick reality show. I mean, I'd watch instantly with my GF. See how that couple, you know, interview that couple, did it increase lovemaking, you know, did it, did they have sicker parties because of it? Stuff like that, where they have able to talk about stuff with their grandmas because of it, because grandmas love credenzas, you know. It's going to say a credenza in a college student's apartment might be the exact same credenza in a grandma's apartment because it was a hand-me-down. You have to look at the things around it. Is there a lava lamp on that credenza as opposed to a tea set, you know? Is there a fat eight-chamber gravity bong resting atop that credenza? As opposed to a slaver with, you know, a silver tea set on there. Or maybe a picture of family. Or maybe a photo album. Yes, they're both credenzas. But how do they relate to things around them? We can then start to deduce who might live there. We can be freaking detectives, dude. When it comes to history, you got to be a detective, dude. When it comes to credenzas, dude... Use those detective skills. It's going to help you appreciate it more. People that knock you for appreciating credenzas, you now have the armor. Not really to defend yourself, but honestly, go on the offense and dominate them like I did earlier. Um, so we can take this reasoning to find out more about history. So honestly, the history of credenzas is honestly a way of the history of, you know, building a foundation for how to dissect and take in history. And, you know, it's just essential takeaway today, I guess, is, you know, how do things, you know, tangible things relate to the world around us? And finally, can we take our own biases out of them, out of the equation as we observe them? That's difficult to do, but it will help us lead to very scientific and, and dank, freaking undeniable facts that then we can, you know, have facts that aren't just grounded in like me just dropping a stat, even though I do love dropping stats, like, you know. Fournette rushed for two touchdowns and 100 yards this week, but what does that relate to? Oh, that relates to other running backs in my league that other dudes drafted for way more money that are now either injured and ran for less yards, and therefore I can now talk shit. 
I can't just say, oh, dude, did you, hey guys, do you hear that Fournette ran for two touchdowns and 100 yards? Oh, dude, did you hear that Fournette ran for 200, for two touchdowns and 100 yards? I only paid 35 for him and you paid for, uh, you know, freaking 99 for McCaffrey and he put up the exact same amount and got hurt. Oh, <laughs> a lot more powerful, a lot more potent. Take that to everything in your life. A credenza can be as revealing as an impo and, 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 and potent as honestly, and this might sound outlandish, Picasso's Guernica, you know, if we allow it to. And now I'm not going to say it's going to have the anti-war message unless, you know, the credenza is displayed with anti-war memorabilia in some sort of museum or something or a veteran's home, you know, and he wants to put those things on there. I don't know. That's, But what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, I guess maybe it's Picasso's quote about Guernica. And allegedly he was asked by a German officer um, when living in uh, Nazi-occupied France during World War II. German officer saw Guernica, looked at Picasso and said, did you do that? Picasso famously responded, no, you did. Because of course the piece is about the, um, the piece came out in 1937, but I think the years previous, 1936 or whatever, it only took like Picasso 30 days to make it very impassioned. And it's a gigantic piece. Um, about the uh, bombing of the town of Spanish town of Guernica at the request of the Spanish government, the fascist government at the time, by the Italians and the Nazi Germans. Um, so if someone asks you, you know, or tells you in your home, yo, dude, you have a sick credenza, you can look back at them and say, no, dude, we have a sick credenza because it's relating to the space and how you're experiencing it together in that moment in simultaneously, individually, in that moment. And so that's freaking dank, dude. And that's why credenzas are dank, dude. Now you know what it is and you know what makes it dank, dude. Makes it dank because it relates to the person taking it in, the shared experience, and everything around it. Freaking fire, dude. It's fire. Do you have a credenza, Aaron? I don't think so. You might have a sideboard or a buffet or an yes. armoire. Yes. Yeah, for sure. See? It's tough. Does it fire you up when you look at it? Do you use it for functional storage? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. When you come to my apartment and you see a very tasteful, you know, Wayfair, CB2, dank, mid-century modern credenza, you'll know that there's definitely a GF that lives here who loves this style. And then you'll open that credenza and you'll see an Xbox in there and you'll go, oh, there's definitely a freaking BF who lives here too who freaking just loves dropping in with his boys. See that? It's detective, dude. Freaking straight up Dick Tracy of credenzas here, dude. Freaking straight up Sherlock Holmes of credenzas, dude. You know what I'm saying, dude? Sherlock Holmes furnishing. <laughs> That's fire, dude. I need to, I'm putting that in the show description, dude. Become the freaking Sherlock, Ho Sherlock Holmes furnishing of credenzas, dude. The freaking trying to think if there's something for Watson, dude. I don't know. Maybe just freaking straight up Watson. Um, let's take a few cues and then head out. It's from Evan. My brother refuses to watch medieval movies and old time movies because he can't imagine not having a shower. So in medieval times and others, when people didn't have modern sanitation, potable water, how do you think the stank was? It's bad. Everyone smelled bad. Also the teeth. You know, we have hot actors. Like, I love that show, um, Last Kingdom, dude. Freaking Uhtred, son of Uhtred, dude. Destiny is whole. You have sold my timber, what? Dude, he, his accent is so hilarious in that movie. Everything he's saying just comes from, like, a strange tone of, like, condescension. Don't get me wrong. He nails it. I forget the actor's name, but he nails it. But Uhtred just the whole time just talking like, yeah, he's talking like everyone just farted around him, kind of like they probably smell bad. Jesus, like, you sold my timber? Why would you do that and sell my timber? Brietta is having Newt's child in Newt murdered my brother. I must have my vengeance on them both. I cannot believe they would betray me like this. It is my destiny to kill Newt. <laughs> Just amazing, dude. But yeah, dude, they would smell terrible, bro. I get it. You know, it's maybe your bro can't, you know, buy into the realism. He wants more realism. But honestly, dude, I don't need people having you know, messed up teeth or smelling bad for period accurateness, dude. Give me the hot actors and just sort of get the history right and keep it entertaining. What about you, Aaron? Do you ever get thrown, dude, during watch, watching, you know, period piece? I mean, I, 
I, I don't if it's good. I'll I'll just buy it whatever whatever happens, you know. Even Robin Hood Prince of Thieves. I just like okay, Robin Hood doesn't have an accent in this one. That's fine. Totally. <laughs> but totally. it's good, you know? Uh what does throw me though sometimes is I'm like now in this time period, how does that guy keep his beard so nicely trimmed? Yeah, some <laughs> things do like, stand out. Or hair, others. yeah, hair and facial hair. I'm like I'm always like I know this is a Hollywood movie because they look great and there's no way they could back then. A hundred percent. A lot of what I think about is because I wear contacts and have horrible vision where I'm like, oh yeah, fucked. Dude, I could have never been William Wallace. I can't see anything. How am I supposed to be in battle and like do any, like I had to get super up close to someone and get murked immediately and I got a lanky body so my distance is my best weapon, keeping guys at bay with a jab or whatever, a freaking javelin. But I wouldn't be able to see. I'd be done. I'd have to be like a shield dude, you know, in, the, in like a fl- phalanx and just protect the dude next to me or honestly like a supply dude. It's the only reason I think about LASIK is for yeah. the apocalypse. Yeah. Aaron, good call. And you know what? No more prevalent time to, than to think about it as right now. Um, yeah. I think about it all the time too. I might, I might be, want to get it soon. It's becoming more affordable. Um, Good morning from Park City Strider. What up? Love Park City, dude. Cute little town. Snow globe downtown. Snow globe quality downtown of how cute that town is, dude. That's where I go and have the fantasy draft, dude. A lot of fantasy uh, through lines here, dude. It's crazy. I'm loving this. Um, we go to High West Tavern with the boys, dude. Freaking enjoy a little freaking whiskey shot and just freaking talk smack and just get ready for the day. It's, it's heaven on earth. It's better than Christmas, dude. Um, I just finished listening to the history of valet and I really loved it because I've been a valet too. Sick, dude. Recently watched the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I was really trying to think of what it would be like to be an outlaw in the wild west during the civil war times. I wouldn't be surprised if you've already considered this topic. I'm sure it'd be fantastic to hear your take on it. P.S. I don't know if you remember doing a cameo for me, but that was rad. So, so thanks again. Sick. Braden, dude, dude, my my pleasure. Dude, freaking fired up to do that. Dude, bring the stoke to you directly. Um, yeah, we kind of did, uh, Aaron and I recently recorded an episode of Cowboy Poetry, which will be coming out before this episode, but, um, yeah, dude, if, in case you missed that one, like, Civil War times, I mean, we talk about Texas, where ranch owners would leave and go fight, you know, mainly on the Confederate side, and would leave slaves back, and then they learn to, their cowboy skills, and, you know, you know, you watch John Wayne movies, it's all white dudes being cowboys, but, you know, that's only about a third of the actual cowboy population was Native Americans, Mexicans, and uh, African American slaves. So, um, yeah, there's a, a whole history on that, dude, and uh, unshared history. There's a great article in the Smithsonian on it, some great books on it, and uh, it was actually a way for, um, you know, post uh, Civil War for freed black men to go and make a more decent, more equal wage because of the skilled labor behind it. So, yeah. I mean, it would stink, too, to Yeah, tie it, it into the previous question. No question. I mean, yeah, you go to a barn. Dude, you even drive out of, like, L.A., like, towards Bakersfield or Barstow, there's t- or, like, even Altadena, right by L.A., mm-hmm. you smell a ton of cows, the methane, dude. It's gross. Yeah. It's gross. Yeah, but put, also, put yeah, hygiene. City. Hygiene's not good. Oh, yeah, dude. Watch any Western, they take one bath maybe in the whole thing. Totally, and they're always... The Dude, you ride a horse for one day. Dude, everything would stink so bad. Dude, yeah. think about knights in armor. The oh. armor under there was disgusting, dude. Yeah, leather. I think there are accounts of like how bad it would smell when like knights, because it took so long to get in it for battle, mm-hmm. they would like try not to get out of it for a long time. It's like, I've got this all on. I might as well just stay in it. You'd be just sweltering hot, dehydrated, dude. The minute I got in that armor, I'd have to poop. No, oh, immediately. That's just how my brain works. Like yeah. I would, my brain would be telling me to go poo first. Wouldn't be able to do it. As soon as it was, uh, as it was on, my body would be like, "We're ready." Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah. No worse, dude. No freaking question. Or like, dude, they would say like U-boats in World War II. You could smell them when they would open the hatch coming back to harbor to resupply, just because of like you know you had forty to sixty dudes on there all wearing their little black undies and boots. Because it was like hot in there, but then it would also be cold. Couldn't they would just go to the engine room and get hot and sweat it up and breathe the diesel and just disgusting, dude. Yeah. I'll just take one more, dude. Strider, dude, been watching the Warzone streams and loving the Dank podcast. Thank you, my dude. Found you from the boys, Chad and JT. Legends, what up, dude? Love their content. Agreed. My tw- I'm 20 years old in Arizona, but I've been stuck for, for a little over a year. Trying to find some Dank bros, but have been able to, uh, haven't been able to find out where to look. 
I've never really had a set of bros in high school, so I'm looking for some wrecks on some places to find a crew. I've played golf for years, but get the geezers can't get uh, can't hang. Get some cool <laughs> war stories though. Anyway, we'll love excellent, to hear back. Excellent use of the word geezer. Yeah, dude, it's amazing. <laughs> geezer. I haven't, I haven't heard geezer in a while. I love it. Hilarious, dude. Um, I mean, dude, we get this a lot about where you're trying to find your crew, and I think it's about more so going in what you're interested in, but at the same time walking that line of balancing trying new things. I mean, you're in Arizona. I mean, Havasu, dude, there's probably plenty of bros out there. Or freaking, I don't know if Lake Powell's in Colorado, but maybe you head out there to some lake, dude, rent a ski do and just cruise, dude. Mm -hmm. Do peck. I mean, honestly, what turns my eye when I'm seeing a bro is good traps, calves, pecks. Work those up. Those are going to catch bro's eyes. Uh, maybe sport a sick beanie. And dudes are going to notice that. Um, you know, I know. Uh, last time I was in Phoenix, they have a big Top Golf out there too. If you're still into golf, Top Golf is tight. I've been to the That's, one in Vegas. Not so many. I wouldn't think as many geezers. No, Top yeah. Golf. You're gonna get a lot of uh, freaking bros there. You're gonna get a lot of um, you guys are some, even some nice cool ladies there you know of, of a crew that's out together you know it's a great place for double dating good place for blind dating um definitely hit up top golf that's sick go call aaron and then also dude yeah so i think that's great because that is a good call Aaron, because it ties in your interest in golf but also will draw a younger crowd yeah uh you're 20 there's you know there's you could take a college course i mean there's mm -hmm. amazing colleges there yeah, go, dude, community college, dude. I yeah, yeah. Community thought about college, doing this with my sure. bro. Just take a motorcycle riding class. You know, get yourself a motorcycle. Very annoying, very loud. I do have disdain for motorcycles, but it's a sick look. Yeah, it really is. Just stand next to one, you know? Go find someone else's motorcycle and stand next to it. Act like it's yours. But then you're building a relationship based on lies, so maybe don't do that. So maybe take the motorcycle class. Stand next to those. Maybe you meet someone who's in there interested in it. That'd be tight, you know? Honestly, the best way to do it is from film and television, you know, solve a mystery together, dude. Mm -hmm. That'd be sick. From an edgy chick. Who, sorry to say chick, dude. My Jeff gets mad when I say that, but um, maybe I was just speaking more in character there. Honestly, I'm just making an excuse, but I'm keeping it in. An edgy, nice young lady who's got a troubled past who just moves to a new town, and then you know you're kind of an outcast. And you guys team up to solve a mystery together in your town of Arizona. That's maybe you even find some gold. There's probably some gold in Arizona buried somewhere in a cave, you know? Yeah. I think that'd be sick. Um, Diet, dude. That's from Tyler. Tyler, dude, hopefully that helps my dog. Um, and then, you know, before you know it, you guys fall in love and you're buying credenzas. Uh, that's a fire up, dude. Hope you guys enjoyed. Please, uh, you know, send me pics of credenzas. I'll share them on the Instagram. I want to see them. Uh, always email suggestions, corrections, comments at striderwilsontreads at gmail.com. You can also watch on YouTube, Fired Up. Aaron, you're a ledge. Thank you, dude. Um, that's it, dude. Freaking stay stuck and lit.